good evening everyone welcome to global business council the think and act series we will continue to talk about us pension system with elvanavi today mr hakan will be our co-host this evening so i am giving the microphone to him mr hakan good evening ladies and gentlemen thank you for being here with us this evening Uh, today we are pleased to welcome again uh, Dr. Elvan Aktaş. This will be the second part of our seminars about planning for retirement savings and investments in the United States of America. So uh, if you have followed the first part, it was almost an intro to the topic. And today he will be sharing with us some his expert opinions and will be answering your questions at the end of the program. So with that, I'm asking your full attention to Mr. Aktaş. Mr. Akash, stage is yours. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And last week, uh, we had a brief discussion about Social Security and sort of uh, the base uh, and, and the guaranteed option for people who qualify, uh, who pay into the system for 10 years. But we also promised that next week we are going to do an, uh, another session that is sort of like an umbrella discussion. So please, by no means, this is, this is not a detailed Uh, investments or retirement planning presentation, which is not possible to do in just 45 minutes or an hour time. So today, I, I again have three goals in mind. Number one is to motivate you, to sort of encourage you to save, have a budget, have a, a sort of a, a structured long-term retirement or structured long-term financial planning. Number two, discuss some of the alternatives, some of the vehicles that are very useful for Muslim Americans or for, you know, uh, uh, people like us, I should say, not just Muslims, but there are some other people who have sensitivities. And number three, uh, sort of some of the list of do's and don'ts. Uh, so this is, this is sort of a, a presentation that evolved. I've done a different version of this presentation to academics. Uh, I am assuming that Many of you, uh, most of our audience is going to be from the educational sector. There are teachers, I'm assuming, there are academics. Uh, also, I expect many of you to be uh, business owners. So some of the terminology will have to be adjusted. Now, let's, let's start with the determining the needs discussion. We need to first have a sort of a honest understanding and honest evaluation of ourselves, okay? Investments, long-term financial planning and retirement planning in the US uh, has two burdens that are both on your shoulders. Please pay attention to this part. Unlike other countries where the government subsidizes a lot of the responsibilities for healthcare, retirement, and many of the other issues, In the United States, two aspects of retirement, retirement and long-term financial planning is on your shoulders. And unfortunately, both of them are, uh, I don't want to say burden, but bad news. Number one, financing of it, which means to have a good retirement. And when I say a good retirement, I'd like to underline the fact that anything I say here is considered boring, uh, long-term, unexciting for people who have a little bit of a knowledge about trading stocks, watching the financial news and things like that. So when we say retirement planning with traditional financial instruments, what we mean by that is for someone to be able to continue the same living standard when they retire. So we don't expect you to implement these, these strategies or use these financial vehicles and be rich. Okay, that's not the idea. If you're, if you're planning to do that, that's a whole different discussion and it involves a, a different risk return framework. So having that in mind, number two burden or the challenge on your shoulders is financing and managing part. Okay, not only you have to save and invest, uh, and we're going to discuss some of the different applications, different situations, but also you need to manage these things. So saving and investing itself and having a discipline is not 
going to be enough. You need to be actively managing this. And it's not rocket science. I'm going to present to you sort of the basics and, and the overall umbrella of what we should understand from this. Of course, any of that discussion has to start with an investor profile, whether this is a technical investor. What do I mean by investor profile? You have an idea about who you are. You have an understanding and people around you have an idea about what kind of person you are. Are you an adventurer? Are you a very conservative person? Do you like taking risks or do you always feel like you should play safe? So there is a technical aspect of investor profile, which is very easy to do. Nowadays, almost every financial institution that offers these services actually has a robo advisor. You go on a website, you answer some questions. Some institutions will call that investor profile questionnaire. Some will call it investor profile survey based on your results, whether it's going to be a numerical uh, a chart, whether it's going to be some kind of a, 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 you know, a rating scale, they'll spit out, they'll tell you, you are aggressive, you are moderately aggressive, you are moderate or you are conservative. The idea behind that is the starting point of any long-term financial plan and any retirement portfolio is what kind of investor you're going to be. Now, why is that important? It is important because you have to match your goals with your actions. If you happen to have a goal of, I'm just making up the numbers, to have $4 million in your 401k account when you retire, but you don't have the guts to take the risk necessary with that because you are saving very little, then we have a problem. Because for an aggressive investor at a young age that is going to contribute for 25, 30 years into a retirement portfolio to enjoy 9, 10, 11% annual return and to build up that 4 million versus a conservative person who's not going to take high risks and who has to limit himself or herself to 7, 8% and to build up to that 4 million is going to require different sacrifices. The conservative person has to make sure because the person chooses by design because of their personality trait, because of their profile, they have to choose safe investments. Anything that's safe in the long run is going to return less. Anything risky is going to, in the long run, return more. However, it will have higher fluctuations. So it's not as simple as simply saying, okay, what do I want and where do I get there? What do you want? Where do you get there? Are you willing to pay for it? Can you stomach the fluctuations in the market? Next aspect of it is something that I always add to my presentations when I'm talking to Turkish people or immigrant groups, because we are, especially, I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to make Jelil Abi mad, but you know, I don't want to offend you or upset you. But here is the thing. People who came from different backgrounds, different education systems, different psychological dynamics, sometimes have a skewed view of who they are and what they want and what they can do. So you need to be honest with yourselves. If I was doing this as a technical presentation, that second item there where you see investor profile personal would not, okay? It's a purely technical issue. It is, it is a measurement scale, but please understand what I mean by that. And then once you have these, these profiles, you define who you are, you define what kind of investor you're going to be, you need to understand that there is a list of priorities that need to be in order. Now, when I say in order, there might be short-term goals, marriage of yourselves, of you, your teenage children, or their college expenses, the renewal of the cars. I mean, these are mostly budget financing items. And then there will be intermediate term goals. What kind of house would you like to buy if you are going to move? If the school district is not something you like, if you want to move because you want to go into a different school district, what kind of real estate investments is it going to require? Do you have investment properties? Are you going to manage some rent? And we are going to come to these under the alternative investment vehicles agenda. And then, of course, the long-term goals. Uh, if you have kids, depending on their age, uh, their college expenses might actually fall into the intermediate goals versus long-term goals. If you're young, your kids are in grade school, in elementary school, or in kindergarten, yeah, you might consider it a long-term. But if you have kids who are in high school, 
that becomes short, sometimes intermediate term goal. And then of course your retirement. So the, the roof, the general structure is not as simple as I get a lot of questions from you people, beautiful people. Uh, it is not as simple as what should we buy, Abi? Should we buy this stock? Should we buy this mutual fund? That's the last decision that you need to make, okay? You psychologically want to jump onto the last decision because that's the excuse for the lack of a better word. That's the sexy one. Everybody wants to talk about Tesla. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to talk about that pharmaceutical company it, which doubled in the six months. This is not a presentation about that. Again, this is the most boring part of finance. Long-term, sustainable, boring financial planning that will build a retirement nest egg for you. Even that comes at the end and, and all that decision-making will come in the end. And let me clarify, what do I mean by that? You need to be realistic about your budget. Nobody can have a sound investment and retirement planning agenda without actually defending the home base. And when I say home base, I'm talking about communication between the spouses, communication between the grown-up kids, the spenders in the house, and early education of the young children in your household. So you have to have a budget. You can't just simply say, well, we are spending less than what we make. You need to go back, open an Excel spreadsheet or many of the credit cards. If you have one main credit card that you do spending, many of the credit card companies actually offer this service. They, they send you a monthly expense analysis. You have to make that. If your spouse is not very knowledgeable about these things, you need to educate your spouse. But you have to get together as a team, have a realistic monthly budget, and then determine what is it that you can set aside for long-term financial planning. Now, let's start with the first tile. That structure, that roof, starts with the first important financial or long-term financial planning need, and that is your insurance needs. I know our background, we have some stigmas, some taboos, but you are living in the United States of America. Many of you are either immigrants or refugees or come from backgrounds where you don't have that tribal support structure you had in Turkey. And again, I'm choosing my words very carefully. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm not, but, but it is true. Whether we choose more politically correct words or not doesn't change the fact that we come from a tribal lifestyle where there is a social network of support. In the United States, you cannot rely on that one. So you have to make sure that you understand in America, insurance needs are based on two factors. Number one, your age, okay? This applies to a billionaire as much as it applies to a, a middle school teacher on a $50,000 a year income. The younger you are, the more insurance you need if you are married and if you have kids. That's a big if, because the second factor is the answer to this question. How much, when I say insurance, by the way, I'm not talking about homeowner's insurance or car insurance. I'm talking about life insurance. How much life insurance you need is first dependent on your age, if you are married and if you have kids. If you're single and uh, the second question's answer is going to be more obvious then. That's not a big deal. But if you are married and you're young, if you have young children and you're married, then your age is going to be inversely related to the amount of life insurance that you need to have. So second question, and which is the more important deterministic factor, is how many people will be financially devastated if you die right now? I know this sounds horrible, but you need to answer this question honestly. You and your spouse, your wife, your husband, sit down and answer this question. If one of you, whomever is the breadwinner, dies right now, how many people will be financially devastated? The number depends on whether you have a non-working spouse, a spouse who maybe doesn't have the education or the career or a job. It also depends on how many young children do you have. 
if you have two children ages five and three, that means you need a lot of life insurance. You need to calculate their financial needs until they're going to become an adult that is financially independent. Hopefully a college graduate who have already has a job and an income. That is for a five-year-old, at least 17 years. For a three-year-old, that is 19 years. At the age of 22, I'm assuming your children will be graduating from college and they will be income earners. So you need to answer this question honestly and then determine how much life insurance you need. Typically, a rule of thumb is your annual income, gross annual income, gross annual salary times two times the number of dependents you have. So if you have a spouse who doesn't work, and if you have two children who are very young, then that means six times. If you are making $60,000 a year, that means $360,000 policy you have to buy. Now, if you buy that policy on your own, it might be very expensive. But if you buy that policy through your employer, as a result of a collective bargaining agreement, then you're gonna get amazing deals. Here's the good news about insurance. The younger you are, the more insurance you need, but the cheaper insurance is. The older you are, the more expensive insurance becomes, but the less insurance you need, okay? I hope this is fairly easy and obvious to understand. Second one, something that immigrant communities and Hizmet people and Turkish people always put aside or put away thinking that, ah, oh, we can do it next month. We can do it next year. A living will. Türkçe vasiyet. We are an immigrant community. What will happen to you, to your belongings, and to your children is going to be determined by your living will. Especially if you have underage children who are not adults, who are not mature adults yet, who are not 18 yet. What will happen to them is going to be determined by your living will. You'd better sit down with your spouse, just like the budget and long-term financial needs, and make sure that you determine who is going to be the executor of this will and who is going to take the custody of your children until your relatives reach here. You can't just simply leave them to the foster child, uh, foster child system in the United States. That will be horribly devastating for your children unless you have next of kin living in the United States, which means that you have a sister, brother, an uncle, somebody who legally can claim custody of your children right away. If you don't have relatives in the United States, please mark my words. Until the system finds out who will get your children, your children will be taken away and will be given to foster care. Don't do that to your children. And then the last one will be your liquidity needs. Within your budget, you need to also understand that it's not just a monthly budget. Down the road, there might be some situations that, that you can foresee. There might be a health condition that will require long-term care. For example, if you have sleep apnea and you know that you're going to need that CPAP machine, or if you have some orthopedic problems and you're going to need a prosthetic, that will require some. So your retirement long-term financial planning needs to be realistic based on some of those foreseeable expenses as well. Now let's talk about the, the whole sexy retirement financial planning discussion. This is the part most of you are listening to this conversation. And I see that on YouTube right now, we have a whopping 35 people, Jilly Lobby. It's, it's a small group, but uh, I hope I hope this will be beneficial to people who watch it later. Maybe we should not save it on YouTube so that they won't ignore our, our programs like this. Number one, this part, the first, the first line you see, TRS versus ORP. It's teacher retirement system versus optional retirement program. Every state, every employer, this is, this is especially important for teachers and professors and academics, because when you are hired, they're going to ask you, do you want the teacher retirement system? The name might be different in your state. So please don't, don't uh, uh, you know, think about the exact name. And the next one is optional retirement program. One, the first one, teacher retirement system is like SESEKA in Turkey or Bakur in Turkey, okay? You, you work for 20, 25 years, whatever, for the same state system. 
Okay, it doesn't have to be the same employer. If you're a teacher at a charter school, if you're a professor at a university and you choose TRS, as long as you move from one university to another in the same state, you're fine. But if you move to another state, you cannot take this money with you. So if you're planning to have job changes, career changes, and move to another state, I do not recommend TRS because you can't take that money with you. The next one is what you know as the typical retirement account in the United States, whether it has the name 401k, if you are working for a company, it's called 401k because it was an exception that was granted to Kodak employees in the 70s. It's a long story, but you can Google it and find out. Okay, It's just the technical name. If you are a, a university employee or an educational institution's employee, then the name changes to 403B. Or if you're self-employed, it doesn't change anything. Instead of calling it a 401k, 403B, you call it an IRA, which is Individual Retirement Account. Now, if you work for a company or if you work for a university, the beauty of it is most of the time your employer will give you matching options. Meaning that, for example, for my institutions, institution, my employer says, if you contribute 6%, we'll give you another 9.5%. That's 9.5% of my annual gross income for free. In addition, now, the government incentive, the third line, in addition, the 6% I contribute is before tax, meaning I deduct that from my taxable income. Somebody who makes $60,000, if they decide to set aside $6,000 into their IRA, 401k, 403b, whatever. They are all called tax deferred retirement options. They are under ORP, okay? Whatever the name, depending on your, or if you're a business owner, you're, you don't even have an employer, you're self-employed, but you're going to do an IRA, then that money you contribute to your IRA, 401k, 403b, whatever that is, is tax deferred. Meaning the government says, here's an incentive for you. If you contribute to a long-term qualifying uh, retirement account, I will not tax you now on that income. So if you're making $60,000 and you contribute 6,000, 6, 10%, then your taxable income drops to 54,000. So you are actually sheltering that 6,000, hence tax deferred. Here's the catch, that 6,000, will be invested into financial instruments that I'm about to show you some examples of. Now, if you're an employee, if you're a teacher, if you're a professor, most likely they will give you a menu of options. If you're self-employed or if you are opening an additional IRA, if you're a teacher, an employee, and your, gover uh, your employer gives you a, a tax deferred IRA, 401k, whatever, you can still, as long as you don't exceed the maximum uh, uh, annual contribution, depending on your income, you can still open another IRA. The beauty of an IRA, which is not part of a 401k, is you can choose individual securities. You can buy Tesla. You can buy an Apple stock. 401ks, 403bs, usually your employer, so that to save you, because they know the average American is not financially savvy enough to go risk everything on individual stocks and which is not advisable for your retirement portfolio anyway. We would like to see Americans to save for long-term and retirement and invest those into long-term retirement vehicles like ETFs and mutual funds. We are gonna come to those in a second. Now, what is the Roth IRA then? Whether it is a Roth 401k, if you are a, an employee of a company, a Roth 403b, if you are a teacher, a professor, or you're a self-employed person and you are actually doing it on your own, whether you are opening a Roth IRA, individual retirement account, the difference is it is not tax deferred. In the previous ones, remember, you contribute your pre-tax tax income. You don't pay taxes on that. You make 60000 you contribute 6,000, that's 6,000, you don't pay taxes on it. So you shelter them now. When you are an old person, when you retire, when you qualify after the age of 60 and a half, then you start withdrawing from that money. That withdrawal is going to be considered an income and you're going to pay taxes. Withdrawal, 
Let me repeat, with Roth 401k, Roth 403b, Roth IRA, doesn't matter. The whole idea of Roth is if you are contributing into a retirement account after tax, meaning that you make $60,000, you already paid your taxes, and your disposable income is $42,000 after Social Security, Medicare, taxes, blah, 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 okay? From that $42,000, you contribute into your Roth. Here is the beauty of it. That money grows. You buy mutual funds. You buy stocks. That money grows and grows and grows in the long run. When you are retired, you withdraw from that money tax-free. You don't pay taxes on it. It is very attractive for people who are younger than 40, 45 years of age. Because think about it. If you're young enough, your already tax dollars will be invested into financial instruments. They're going to grow and you're not going to pay taxes from that growth. Okay. It is so juicy and attractive. The government puts actually a limit on it. I believe this year the limit is $6,800. So the government does not allow you to have your entire retirement on Roth. If the government allowed me, for example, I'm 47 years old, what I would do is, what I would like to do is put all of my retirement into Roth right now. Whatever my tax bracket is, 20, 25%, I would like to pay that tax now and then let that money grow, 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 grow. When I'm retired, I would love to withdraw as an income that is tax-free. So the government won't let me, which means if the government says there is a limit on how much you can do something, take it. That means it's good for you. Okay? It's an American joke. Again, I'm not trying to be offensive or politically incorrect, but in America, it's a joke. If, if the government says there is only this much you can do, go ahead and do it to the fullest, because that means it's good for you. It's not good for the government. So please, if you are older than are benefiting from a Roth plan, at least explain this, because if you're older than 45, I'm assuming you have kids who are coming to an age where you have to have this discussion about saving and retiring and all that, open a Roth IRA account on behalf of your kids. Teach them the value. Teach them the benefit of this. Get them started at the age of 15, 16. This is not something you can delay, especially for people who moved here, who have a, a plan to stay in the United States, to retire in the United States. Do not think that your children are going to actually move back to Turkey or other countries because they're growing up as Americans, which is perfectly fine. I'm an American and I'm proud to say that. So let's integrate into the system. Let's benefit. Let's take advantage of all the incentives this system gives us. If you are too old to do growth, then it is time for you to think about your children to start growth investments. Just today, I have a professor friend who was telling me that his son, who just graduated from college, uh, uh, is now trading. I said, that's fine. Give him a little money. Let him, let him play around in E-Trade or TD Ameritrade. Doesn't matter. But I said, also open a Roth account for him. He needs to understand that. So e there are two possibilities. Either you're young and you should open a Roth account for yourself, or you're too old to benefit from Roth, then you should start one for your children. Even if it's just a couple of hundred dollars, teach them now because when they have a real... Uh, 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 significant income, they should know the benefits and the, the leverage of, of these uh, accounts. Now, personal sensitivities, what do I mean by that? I'm not going to go into the philosophical or theological discussions, what's haram, what's halal. All I'm going to tell you is, if you have Islamic concerns, if you have environmental concerns, if you have political concerns, there are mutual funds, there are financial investment vehicles that are custom tailored for you. There is no excuse. There is no excuse for anyone in the United States. I am actually uh, trying to help out an Islamic school's foundation money, an Islamic school. And the board actually told the investors that they have to invest into Sharia compliant companies. There are mutual funds in the United States who actually go do research and find, not as a 100% guarantee, but at least find some companies that are in much, much less violation of Islamic sensitivities. Same thing is true for SGA. Please mark this word, S-G-A. Sustainability, governance, and 
I, 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 now I'm, I'm shooting a blend. SGE, I'm sorry, it's not SGA, SGE, environmental. So the new Americans, the new generation, the young Americans are very sensitive about these things. So for Wall Street is not going to be blind. They are now listening. They are going, okay, there is an entire generation of investors coming, joining the workforce. We need to make ourselves attractive to their sensitivities. Okay, so please, uh, when I say sensitivities, think about the whole thing, not just Islamic sensitivities. The last item, this presentation is copy pasted from a very, very old one from year 2013. There we were still talking about, you have to sit down with your spouse and talk about, are you going to stay here and retire here? Or are you going to go back? Well, no comments. Okay. You know what I mean by that. So if you're thinking that you're going to go back and have retirement over there, well, he, he, I'll, let me be honest with you, okay? He, let me be a little more, I don't know, politically incorrect. Let's be honest with each other. If you plan for a nice retirement, at least reasonable retirement in the United States, and you choose to move back, say that Turkey becomes, again, a seemingly functioning democracy, seemingly a, a, a rule of law, okay? Let's say, let's assume. If you actually prepare for a retirement in the U.S., you can retire in Turkey like kings and queens. But if you don't do that, if you assume you're going to go back to Turkey and you can't, you're going to be broke in the United States. I joke to my students when I teach investments. I tell them, when you walk into Walmart, you see these old people at the gate. They come and tell you, welcome to Walmart. They are not there because they like it. Okay. You see a lot of very old people working at cashiers and stuff like that. They are not there because they like it. People who prepared for retirement are living in golf communities. They are enjoying life or they are in senior life, uh, senior living communities where they have assisted living or people who come and clean their houses. So please mark my words. If you prepare to retire in America, you can always go back and, and live comfortably. Even your social security would be good enough to have a meaningful uh, 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 living standard in the U.S. But if you can't just plan for retirement, thinking about the best case scenario. Now, what are those many options? I am now talking about the options, the most common financial investment vehicles for people who are going to do 401k, 403b, IRA, or any Roth form of these, okay? Whether you are a teacher, professor, or self-employed business owner, overwhelming majority of your investments are going to be in mutual funds. Mutual funds are portfolios that are managed by professionals for a fee that invest in certain kinds of company stocks, bonds, and real estate, and alike, based on their prospectus. Just like, you know, when you, when you get a, a, a medicine or drug from a store, you open the box and there is a prospectus in it, right? Because that tells you what this drug is made of, what it's supposed to do, the side effects and the dangers. Same thing with mutual funds. When a mutual fund is marketed to investing public, they have to go through certain regulations. They have to tell you what kind of mutual fund they are. The most common form for people like you, people who are trying to stay away from bonds and interest and riba and haram stuff, is going to be parked in either equity funds or some index, fund, index funds. Equity funds, equity means stocks. That means these are mutual funds. Majority of their money, their holdings are company stocks. Again, I'm not going to go into the technical details of there are Islamic funds, there are different kinds of funds, but at least you need to know what kind of fund families do we have. Every fund's name, I guarantee you, will have certain keywords in them. For example, if a mutual fund, I'm just giving an example, by the way, I'm not endorsing a company, but let's say you're looking at a tier of price US large cap fund, large cap equity fund. That means tier of price. Tiro Price is managing a portfolio that is mostly made of 
large cap. Large cap means large companies, Apples, Microsofts, and Boeings, and Walmarts, and Teslas, and things like these are large co uh, cap companies. A large cap company is usually a company whose total shares in the market is worth more than $10 billion. One more time. Every time you see the word large cap, it means companies, either they are like mega large cap, meaning Apples and Microsofts and Amazons that are larger than $1 trillion right now, okay? Or these are large cap because they are larger than $10 billion, billion with a B, Balıkesir B, okay? Now, mid cap is mutual funds that invest, mid cap equity funds is mutual funds that invest into companies that whose market value is between 2 billion and 10 billion, mid cap. Cap means capitalization, by the way. It means the value of traded equity, value of shares outstanding in the market. And then, of course, you have the small cap that is less than $2 billion. Now, another classification of mutual funds is growth versus value. And please do a Google search. I'm not going to go into technical details. If Google is too superficial for you, uh, on the on the notes, I don't know if we can do notes on YouTube, Jellabi, but you can write this down, investopedia.com. Okay, I wish I, I had remembered that and put in my presentation. Investo, investopedia.com. Think about like Wikipedia. Instead of Wiki, put investo, investopedia.com. That is the dictionary, free finance dictionary for you on the internet. Anytime you see a technical term, you're reading a brochure, some document your employer gives you, or you went to your bank and opened an IRA account and they give you a whole bunch of stuff to read, but it sounds like French to you. It sounds like a, a foreign language. You don't understand this. That's fine. You're not supposed to. Not everybody is, is, is a, a, a financially savvy or skilled person. This is like a language. You need to expose yourself. Anytime you see a technical word you don't understand, go to investopedia.com. It's, a, it's like Wikipedia, it's a search engine. You type, it will come up with an article. Within the article, there will be technical terms. Each one is going to be clickable. So you can actually keep clicking from one word to the other. And every day, you can slowly educate yourself about these. Next one is the index funds. You hear these words all the time. S&P 500 did this today. NASDAQ did this today. Or Dow Jones Industrial Average went up 2%. Trading was blah, blah. These indices, indices is the plural of index, okay? These indices represent a segment of the market. For example, S&P 500 is the largest, the most dominant uh, of 500 largest companies in the US. They make up more than 80% of total value in the US. If you're looking at S&P 500, you're looking at almost the entire market. But if you want to look at NASDAQ, then you're looking at mostly small companies and technology companies or Russell 2000. So there are different indices, but an index is an average. You can't buy and sell an index. So Wall Street is smart. They came up with this idea. Why don't we create mutual funds that actually mimic these indices? So if you, if you don't want to deal with large cap, small cap, this and that, you just say, you know what? I just want to buy the market. So you can go ahead and buy an index fund. The beauty of index fund is they have very low turnover, meaning the fund will charge you much, much, much less fees. They are cheap in the long run. If you're paying a 1.05% expense ratio or 1% expense ratio for a typical equity mutual fund, you're going to pay zero point, I don't know, sometimes 0.1% on an index fund. So you can actually buy a segment of the market. Now, another one, which is not in my notes, I believe. Yeah. Oh, it, it is. Sorry. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that one. ETFs. This is a very misunderstood concept. Please take your red pen, write ETF exchange traded fund and write it with a red pen because I want to warn you about these. These now are becoming a problem for long-term investors because especially leverage ETFs seem to be very attractive to people who are lazy 
who don't want to think about different segments, different industries, or different mutual fund types. They just want to buy the ETF. ETFs are not long-term financial instruments. They are portfolio insurance, hedging instruments. So please take your notes. This is your homework. Go to e Investopedia. Learn what ETFs are because there are ETFs. For example, let me give you an example. There is an index ETF that mimics S&P 500. Okay, spider. A spider is if S&P 500 goes up 2%, that ETF will go up 2%. If S&P 500 goes up down 3%, that ETF will go down 3%. During the day, it's, unlike mutual funds, they trade like during the day in a, in a uh, stock exchange. So that's why the name exchange traded funds. However, many exchange traded funds, ETFs, are going to be leveraged, meaning, for example, a double long spider. Double means twice. Long means in the same direction. If S&P 500 goes up 5% in one day, a double long S&P 500 in ETF will go up 10% in that day. That's leverage. But it comes with a price. You might be thinking, oh, that's a good idea. But if S&P 500 goes down 5% in one day, then that ETF will go down 10%. So it's a double amplification on both directions. There are triple long ETFs. It gets crazy. Now, I don't want to confuse you too much at an initial general discussion, but there are also double short and triple short ETFs. Double, triple, you already understand what it means. Whatever the index does, it does it twice or three times. Short means in the opposite direction. If you buy a triple short spider, triple short S&P 500 ETF, if S&P 500 index that day goes up 3%, your ETF will go down 9%. Remember, it's triple three times. Three times three is nine. Short means in the opposite direction. Why would anyone with a functioning brain need these things? These are for hedging. Coronavirus is coming. You are worried that the market is going to take another dip. One conservative strategy for trading would be well, you wait for the market to dip or you short the market and then you catch the other end. But a triple long, triple short ETF will allow you to buy that insurance with very, very small amount. Okay. So you might say, Elman Ali, Dr. Aktash, what are you talking about? We are talking about retirement planning, long-term uh, portfolio planning, financial planning. What trading? Exactly why I made you write ETF with a red pen. ETF, what did I tell you? ETFs are not long-term investment vehicles. They are short-term hedging and portfolio insurance vehicles. Anyway, I don't want to go too much into detail because we are already past our time. Bond funds. Everyone you know around you will say, well, this is riba, this is haram interest. I'm not going to go in there. However... Also know that there are some Islamic bonds that are called sukuks. Personally, I don't believe that there is Islamic banking, there is Islamic this and that. But again, I'm just presenting to you because everybody has a different sensitivity. Personally, I just period. I mean, you don't have to. Even when you get old, there are different ways, methods, and your financial advisor can tell you how to do that. Next one is real estate funds. You don't have to buy real estate to benefit from real estate uh, uh, fluctuations. There are mutual funds that invest into real estate uh, uh, vehicles. However, we call them REITs, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trusts. You need to be careful. There are two types of real estate funds. One that buys the mortgages through bonds that buys the real estate directly. For as a Muslim, I suggest you should do the second one if you think real estate is a good investment. Next one is guaranteed funds. Many fund families, especially for old people or people who are very close to retirement or in retirement, they're going to say, okay, you know what? You don't want to expose yourself to market fluctuations. Here's a guaranteed fund. Or annuities are the same thing. I doubt that we can do that. As a people, uh, Muslim Americans, I doubt that anyone would give the fat that we can do this money market funds again the same thing short-term 
instruments for institutional investors to park their money, not for you and me. The last one, however, is interesting. The last one is a target date fund. Let's say you are 47 years old and it is year 2020. Your goal is to retire when you are 67 years old. So you have 20 years. Instead of you actively thinking about, okay, as I get older, I need to change my portfolio composition, blah, blah. You can actually buy a target date fund. A target date fund, the name will actually say 2040. Target date 2040 fund. That fund is specifically designed for people who are going to retire in year 2040, 20 years from today. However, the previously mentioned sensitivities make this kind of questionable for us because if you are so sensitive that you want to know what kind of companies are in these funds, target date funds are not going to cut it for you. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. In, in America, this is kind of a, a nice joke that I, I use all the time. You can't just have sensitivities on one hand and automated retirement planning on the other. It doesn't work like that. If you have sensitivities and you want to make sure that your money goes into uh, companies that you approve of, then you have to actively manage your holdings. You can't have somebody do it all for you under one roof. Now, next one, let's say that we assume that uh, 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 you, you are responsible, you do your budget, you do your planning, you created your portfolio. Now what? Well, it's not an automated process. Unless you're do doing a target date fund, you have to be actively involved. But it's not rocket science either. First of all, you know, I, I don't know any Turkish person, especially for males, uh, our, our sisters and, and our, our, our female audience, please forgive me for this, but this example works really well for them. I don't know any Turkish person who doesn't know something about cars, especially around the time when they buy a new car, they go search, research, they do, you know, what's the good deal, what brand is, you go look at consumer report, you look at their ratings and you look at financing options, you look at their mileage and how many you know, seats do you need, blah, blah, blah. You look at SUVs, minivans. So for a car that you're going to use for six, seven years, you do all that work. Don't you think your retirement requires a little bit of attention? Or we are all, I'm assuming we are all Muslim Americans here. So we tell people who complain, we tell Turkish people who complain that, oh, you know, this is all Arabic. You know, these namaz surahs, all Arabic. We tell them, listen, this is important. You know, you should, you should at least know what you read in namaz, what that means. So same thing here, same motivation, my friends. This is your retirement. You can't just simply say, oh, yeah, I saved the money, put it in an account. I'm just letting it sit there. No, you have to familiarize yourself. What's going on? For example, this COVID, uh, me and Jelly Ravi, this is our, what, fourth program since the COVID. So why? Because we are trying to educate our people about, okay, what's going to happen? This is a macro change. If U.S. goes into another interesting battle, not necessarily war battle, killing people battle, but different kind of battles with China, it's going to shape up some of the macro regimes in the, in the world, right? So if the energy sector changes, what does that mean? At least, at least you should have an idea. Just like a Turkish guy knowing that, hmm, there are now the hybrid cars. They burn less gas. You don't have to be an engineer to understand what a hybrid car is. When you need one, you don't go build one, but you at least need to know what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages. Now, from hybrids, we have electric cars. How many of you know exactly how an electric car works? But you have pretty good idea what the benefits are. You always feel like, okay, what's the range? What if I'm driving through a cross country and where am I going to recharge this car, right? I mean, these are simple common sense concerns that you have. You understand how an electric car works. You need to familiarize yourself with global and domestic macro trends, meaning what's happening in the world, what's happening in the United States, how are these going to change my portfolio? The stuff that I purchased, if let's say you bought a whole bunch of uh, environmental renewable energy stuff, okay, gas prices dropped to $29 per barrel, you're in trouble. 
If you don't know how to read these trends, then uh, you're going to be in trouble. How can you be blind if you're owner of a whole bunch of you know, renewable energy stuff and oil prices dip, suddenly the renewable energy stuff becomes less valuable, right? Or the opposite is true as well. There is a political situation that might jeopardize the supply of oil. Suddenly things change. So at least you need to familiarize with yourself and I want you, I invite you to pay attention to that last line, free professional help. Whether you're a teacher, you work for a school, you're a professor, you work for a university, or you're an employee at a company. Your company, your employer, teams up with a financial institution who deliver these menu items to you. They team up with Tiro Price, Fidelity, TIA Craft, whatever. All of them have professionals on pay that are waiting for you to call that 1-800 number. If you can't figure it out, call these people and get help. If you're self-employed, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna open that IRA account at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch or whatever. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just saying that wherever you open that IRA account, they have free professional help. And that free professional help comes with the fiduciary duties. They can't lie to you. They can't cheat. It's illegal. They have to tell you the truth. But you need to educate yourself to ask the right kind of questions. I know, Jalil, we are running late, so I'm going to hurry up a little bit. Now, uh, yep, Edwin, we have some couple of questions, so we are waiting for when you okay. end. You will... Now, this, this part, frequency of reallocation and your risk per perception and the trading parameters, what, do, what does it mean? How often are you going to change the composition of your portfolio? What is your risk perception of the market? What kind of risk you can tolerate or you go, this is fine. You know, I'm in the long run. I can tolerate this. Or what are your exit strategies? You bought something. Let's say that you jumped the, the wagon and said, you know what? I'm going to buy some Tesla. But in your mind, you should have an exit strategy. You don't buy Tesla thinking that it's going to go up for forever, right? So all of those depend on that beginning point about investor profile. The first part. If you... If you are not a person who can play with fire, if you are not a person who can tolerate these things and manage under stress, don't play with fire, okay? Stay away. Just do the long-term boring thing. So I'm just, again, underlining that thing. And again, it's not an accident. It's not a typo. At the end of the, at the bottom of the page, what do you see? Free professional help. You don't have to do this alone or you don't have to email Elvan Abe all the time, okay? These are professionals who get paid to do this for free because if you email me, I'm going to send you to them anyway. Now, here are the, the this is the last part I promised you, Labi, and I'm going to end with this, the long-term discipline. I told you that my third goal is to give you a list of do's and don'ts. Do's we already talked about. Here are the things that are don'ts. Your long-term retirement portfolio, whether it is in an IRA or 401k type account or Roth type account, or you're just simply doing it over cash, okay? You're not even getting the uh, US government involved with a tax deferred plan. You're just doing it on your own, which is fine. Some people choose that. They go, okay, I want to have my money at my disposal all the time. But you have to have the self-discipline not to use that portfolio as a rainy day account. The joke it's not a joke, actually. It's a very serious warning that I tell my students is you get cancer, you can't touch this. You had an accident, you need to buy a new uh, car, you can't touch this. Your house got demolished and you have to do a short sale. Your house is getting foreclosed. You cannot touch this. This is not a rainy day account. This is something that you have to put away and forget. It is not there until it is time for you to change the portfolio. Why? Number one, you all know that whole famous saying by Einstein, right? Einstein says, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. The one who's smart is the one who earns it. The one who's stupid is the one who pays it. Well, Einstein never said that. It's a joke that finance professors use it all the time. Here's the part. Compound interest, meaning that these annual rate of rate, it's not riba we are talking about, by the way. It's not haram. It's not FIS. We are talking about that annual percentage growth of your money in your retirement account. If you withdraw early, 
you're not just simply withdrawing from just any other account. You are sacrificing a huge growth potential that would be your income when you retire. So if, if you do a calculation, I sat down one day, I created a hypothetical person at the age of 37, and I made him withdraw $50,000 from his 401k account. At a growth rate of 8%, the interest rate that he's paying for that $50,000 is as if he's borrowing with a 1,200% loan. Yüzde 1200 faiz. 1,200% loan. That's stupid. Don't do that. Go sell other stuff. Go borrow from somewhere else. Do not use your retirement account as a rainy day account. Number one reason you shouldn't do it is because compound. Number two, the government is going to charge you early withdrawal penalties. Because remember, you had a pact. You had an agreement with the government. You told them, I'm sheltering this now from my taxes so that this is going to be my return. Now you are withdrawing. Uncle Sam is going to beat you up. Number three, huge tax penalties. They're going to hit you up with a higher tax than what you would pay normally if you had that income. Don't do that. Again, the last part there, free professional help. If you call that 1-800 number, the person is going to tell you anything short of yelling at you. Since I'm your Abi, I am yelling at you. I'm telling you, do not withdraw money from your retirement account. Another don't. When the stock market is hitting the roof, everything is hitting gold. Everything is going up. What do people do? They go buy stuff. When the stock market is tanking, it is now trashed out. It is now crashing. It's a crisis. Coronavirus, 2008, whatever. It's crashing. What do people do? They sell. Don't. That's called cyclical training. It means you're doing things after the market already done it. If you're buying after the market already appreciated, you're buying things expensive. If you're selling things after it dipped, you're selling your holdings at a cheap price. Very few people and very disciplined people can do counter cyclical trading. What you're supposed to do and your mutual fund manager is doing is actually when the market crashes, guess what they're doing? They're buying. When the market hits the roof, guess what they're doing? They're selling. But majority of the people don't have the nerves or the discipline to do that. So please don't follow the herd. If you are in this in the long run, then all you have to do is calm down and keep buying. Keep buying until you are 10, 15 years within retirement. Keep buying. Then you're going to talk about some liquidation uh, uh, strategies. And, and it's, I'm going to end it with a joke there. It says, remember how cranes fly. Do you know how cranes fly? I'm sure when you were a kid, you saw the Lalex, Lalex, uh, how they fly. They don't, they don't clap their wings. They keep circle. What are, what are they circling? Cranes actually find hot air pockets, the air that rises. So they circle that, they rise, and then from, from that height, they glide down to the next air pocket. So without clapping their wings, they are actually flying hundreds, thousands of miles without spending any energy. So passive investing and not being a herd mentality, panic investor actually allows you to do that. So be like cranes. Don't be like squirrels. Squirrels jump up and down in panic. Don't do that. Now, one last warning. You have to be, I already told you this. You have to be on the same page with your spouse wife, husband, with your children, if they are old enough to encourage them to invest, if you are too young, to teach them the value of money. And you have to, again, you can get free professional help from the internet or from your financial institution. There is a lot of literature out there, games, movies, comedies. I mean, a lot of help on YouTube. Please uh, educate each other, educate your family, make sure that you are on the same page. And I apologize, I exceeded my time limit by almost 15 minutes. So let's hit those questions, Jill Abi. Thank you very much, Elvan Abi. Uh, Hakan Abi, can you help me for questions? Yes, of course. I have small screen, so I am yes. getting old, couldn't see well. Please help me. Of course. Uh, the first question will be, uh, I had worked as a teacher in a state 
and I have TRS. If I move another state, what will happen? May I get this money back? Okay, good question. For teachers, each state has its own vesting rules. Vesting meaning how many years you are supposed to work in that state to qualify to be able to take that money. For example, I believe in Georgia, gosh, it has been 13 years since I moved here. When they looked at, when they gave me that option, I looked at it and go like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do TRS. Because what if I decide to, I moved here from Florida. What if I decide to move? They said, well, in 10 years, you can actually take that money. But here's a big but with one T. When you move, when you take that money, you are allowed to transfer that money into a similar account in most cases. So there are two unknowns, my friend. One, the state that you live in right now, what their rules are. Two, the state that you're moving to, you need to make sure that they have some kind of a compatibility. Most of the time, as long as you are vested, you're not going to lose a lot of money, but you're not going to have the entire benefits with you. It doesn't necessarily mean you can just take the money. Again, remember, let's go here. I don't want to yell at you again, but do not withdraw the money. Transfer that money. Let me repeat. Those are two separate things. When you're moving, if you withdraw the money, then you're going to get hit with early withdrawal penalties, tax penalties, and all of that. And you're going to sacrifice all that growth potential. But if you transfer it to another TRS or to another uh, state's program, at least you carry those benefits with you, if not the 100% of your, of your money. Thank you very much. Uh, then the second question is, if I invest 401k, which bracket will I pay when I retire? It depends on how much money you have when you retire. If you, if, you, if you withdraw when you retire, you have so much money, you've done your job and your money grow into millions, you're withdrawing $120,000, then so be it. You're going to have a, a $120,000 tax bracket. If you, if you are, that's why at the beginning I said, please think about this as a way to maintain your living standard. The idea should be if you are, managing your family right now with the $80,000 annual gross income, shoot for at least $80,000 income per year in retirement. Okay? So that your tax bracket and your living standard is not going to change much either. Okay, thank you. Um, can I take a loan against my Roth IRA or 401k? There are some programs, there are some states that allow that. I... Unless, unless you are guaranteed to pay it back, okay? Let me repeat. Unless you are guaranteed to pay it back, don't do it. Because remember, when you take a loan against your 401k, and if you default, they're going to confiscate your 401k. It's going to be horrible for you. So understand that if you have to do it, it has to be in a way that you know you're going you're gonna to pay it back. And make sure that the interest is reasonable. Yes, you can do that depending on what state you are. There are some different state regulations, but yes, you can take out some loans uh, depending on your employer agreement and who you are working with. But in most cases, the answer is yes. In most cases, my recommendation is don't do it. Okay, thank you. Um, may I convert my 401k account to a Roth or Roth account to a 401k? Sometimes the federal government, every once in a blue moon, allows people to do that. Watch out. Every year, ask your CPA when you're doing your taxes. Uh, watch out. Uh, you can just simply Google it every year. Sometimes the federal government, allow I'm not aware of an annual program that allows that, but sometimes there are uh, windows they allow you especially for different age brackets, people who are close to retirement. So if they made a timing mistake, the government tries to help them out by converting from one to the other. It is possible, but it is a very specific time window. Okay. And um, for any Roth options, can we also invest in for unemployed spouse or children under 18 years old? Yes. Okay. That's why I said... Open a Roth account for your uh, for your children as well. Okay. 
But remember, if you open a Roth retirement account for your children, they're not going to be able to touch it until they are 60 years old. Okay? Okay. So that's a, that's a very long shot. I would rather, if you have young children, I would rather recommend opening a flexible college spending uh, 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 program for them. That's also tax deferred. But as long as they, as long as they withdraw that money when they get uh, the college age for educational purposes, tuition, books, and uh, boarding and whatever, then they can actually withdraw that money. That's a, that's a more immediate help for your children. However, if you want to teach them the value of growth and investing, you can start an account on their name. Uh, if you have a baby and you put a thousand dollars on a road, think about it over 60 years, you put it on a, on an index fund. Uh, he or she will be very, very thankful and grateful when they retire. Okay. Thank you. Um, for any road options as business owners, how can we apply to road? Um, I think you have already mentioned about the professional help. Um, how can we reach out this professional help? Should we talk to our accountants when we are filing tax or should we Google for some professional help? No, I mean, these are usually done under financial institutions umbrella. Most likely, 90% of the, the, the case, your bank already offers these services. For example, I know Bank of America offers these services from your same login on your cell phone. Actually, you can manage these things. That's the beauty of it. So if you, if you are looking for convenience, do it with a financial institution that already uh, manages your accounts. But uh, uh, any financial institution will allow you to do that. And your CPA will only handle uh, the paperwork for it. Unless your CPA has securities license. Some CPA firms also have securities licenses, meaning that they, they have financial planning services. If you're working with a CPA firm, especially large, mid-size or large CPA firms, they might be offering financial services and, and they might actually be a nice, you know, one shot uh, 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 shopping for you. Okay. Um, and once we start our retirement plan with a financial institute, can we switch this plan to another financial institute? Always. No problem whatsoever. Because remember, the financial institution who's managing your account is not holding your uh, financial, uh, financial vehicles or instruments for them. They are holding them for you. You can always transfer it to another financial institution. The portfolio belongs to you. They just house it there. And they do the paperwork so that at the end of the year, they tell you, okay, here is your 1099, whatever contribution, something. So give it to your CPA so they can uh, do your taxes. That's the beauty of ORP. Uh, when I was answering that TRS question, I forgot to mention, if you have a 401k, if you have a 403b or IRA, whatever, when you move from one company to the other, one state to the other, from one employer to the other, you take it with you, okay? Because that has nothing to do with your employer or the financial institution who manages that. For example, I was a faculty member in Florida. I had a TIA CREF uh, retirement plan. When I moved to Georgia, TIA CREF opened another account. When I log into my TIA CREF account, I see both of them side by side. Although I don't even live in Florida, my account is still there. It's sitting there. I can transfer it to Georgia. No problem. I just didn't because... I hold them in separate uh, accounts because I manage them differently. You have all the flexibility as long as, let me repeat, let me, you know, wag the stick. As long as you don't withdraw and spend the money, as long as it stays in that tax sheltered government incentivized retirement account, where you carry it, who manages it is irrelevant. Okay. Um... What is the difference between term and permanent life insurance? Please talk to an insurance broker because in the old days, term life, permanent life, whether they invest the money and if you don't die to a certain age, how much of your money you get back, those rules keep changing. Since I don't want to endorse any product, I'm trying to be very careful. I'm not trying to sell you anything. But all you need to do is we actually have our own friends who do that for a living. Just talk to an insurance broker, life insurance broker. They will, they will tell you what kind of, I mean, the menu is now so rich. 
But basically the idea is this. Sometimes you get a better deal, a cheaper life insurance policy, if you accept the fact that if you don't die, you don't get anything. Okay, it's a, it's a trade-off. So you pay, for example, I'm paying $27 a month. But if I don't die in the next 20 years or whatever, until I retire, or as long as I keep that policy alive, I don't get any money back. So they, they sell you different products. You pay a little more, they say, you know what? If you pay a little more, we invest that money for you. And if you don't die, we at least give you some of your money back. But the, the rate of return on that is so minimal. You have to do a calculation. It's almost like trying to calculate, should I buy a car, the car payment versus lease a car? Okay. So there is a trade-off. Sometimes the lease payment looks really low, but it comes with some costs associated with that mileage limit and things like that. Very similar. Yes, uh, life insurance policies are a whole lot more affordable. They're cheaper if you forego, if you uh, sacrifice the potential earnings from that money. Sometimes your budget might require, or if you have many children, if you have too many children and you need a lot of life insurance, you look at the price and you go like, oh my goodness, you know, I don't want to pay $60 a month to something that doesn't pay anything or that, that pays me return, I would rather pay $20, but I'm just gonna forget it. So it's a, it's a trade-off. That's the difference between different types of insurance. But again, there's those names change, programs and incentives change all the time. I don't wanna endorse a product here. Okay, two last questions. Um, are there any other opportunities like Roth IRA, which is limited to put money by government? I don't know if that's the proper question, but I'll, I mean, I think the question is about government tax incentives. The question, I mean, the answer to that, if I answer the, the if I understand the question right, the split is, do you pay taxes now and then enjoy your withdrawing when you're retired tax free, or you don't pay taxes now but you pay taxes when you withdraw. And your age, your age uh, becomes a, a huge determining factor. If you're in your 50s, a Roth might not make much sense to you right now, okay? So if you're young, then it does. I am not aware of any other Roth type government incentives unless there are certain exceptions. I don't know. Okay, and the last question, uh, most of us, we know your opinion about this, but that's the question, so I need to ask. Are there any options of retirement with Bitcoin? No. no. I've, I've never heard about that. I mean, the reason for that is because Bitcoin still is considered an investment vehicle. The reason I say that sharp no is I know there are charlatans out there who tell you that they are going to give you a retirement blah, blah, blah with digital currency. But here is the catch. When I was doing my taxes this year, one of the questions was, did you buy and sell digital currency this year? Have you ever done uh, your taxes in the United States where the government says, did you buy and sell dollars this year? Because dollar is money. You don't buy and sell dollar. But the government asks you for investment return, taxable investment return. So that means... Uh, cryptocurrency is considered uh, an investment vehicle or speculation vehicle, and the government wants to tax you on that one. So categorically, legally, it can't be like a retirement account. They can market it that way. Some charlatans, I'm sure they can, but stay away from them. Well, I asked Ilahiyat Chavis, and they said it's haram anyway. Stay away from them. Elvan <laughs> And Hakan abi, thank you very much. Uh, Elvan abi, we have a little bit time and there is a one Turkish que questions. It is not in our subject today. Different. I see it. Do you want to answer or no? Be, let me see the question. Konu dışı bir sorum olacak. Stak alıp satarken en uygun zamandan nasıl emin olabiliriz? Bir şey yükselmeye devam ederken veya düşmeye devam ederken nasıl bilebiliriz? Cevap çok kolay. Zaten soruyu soran da Adam Smith. Çok güzel bir şey. <gülüyor> Adam Smith'e göre bunu bilemezsiniz. Bunu bilenler 
Varsa siz onların varlığından haberdar olamazsınız. Eğer ben bunu biliyor olsaydım ben benim varlığımdan haberdar olmazdınız. Evet. Efendim kumardan uzak durun. Kumar bize göre değil. Yok böyle işler yani. Bir vurayım, üç kaçayım, beş vurayım, on alayım. Bunlar bize göre değil zaten. Biz biz benim buradaki amacım my goal let's switch to channel one. My goal here is to help our community to integrate to America. And a big part of integration is financial freedom. And a big part of that financial freedom is having a long-term retirement plan. Because we are getting old. Time flies. Uh, before you know it, your kids are going to get married. They're going to be out of the house. You're going to have gray hairs like mine. Why do you think I keep my, my hair so short? Because I don't want to look old. So uh, don't, don't gamble with your children's money. Ailenizin nafakasıyla kumar oynamayın. Yapmayın. Bize yakışmaz. Okay. Thank you very much for kind advice and for your time. It was very useful for everyone. And thank, thank you, you very for much. listening. And please understand that this is a introductory, superficial, very, you know, uh, general idea of what's available out there. You need to do your homework. Inshallah. Okay, thank you for everyone. Have a nice weekend.